say that a lot of very bright people have broken their heads over the years trying to uh, understand the dark energy. At first, we tried to understand why it was zero when we thought it was zero. And now uh, the problem is to understand why it is what it is. And there are no very good explanations. There are some uh, that have been offered, but none obviously is correct. Mm -hmm. well, well, hang on. We have a lot to talk about. We have a whole hour to do it. We have to take a break and uh, pay some of the bills here. I'd like to, so we're going to take a break and come back and talk more with the Lawrence Krauss, Michael Turner, Brian Green, and Stephen Weinberg. Our number, one 800 998 We encourage you to step up to the microphones here if, if you're here with us at the Arizona State University. Also, uh, Twittering. Bring, send those Twitters in, and uh, our phone number, as I say, 1-800-999-8255. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. You're listening to Science Friday from NPR News. You're listening to Science Friday from NPR News. We're at the Conley campus at the Arizona State University at their Origins Symposium with my guests, Lawrence Krauss, who was, uh, who was the driving force behind the symposium, Michael Turner, Kavli Institute uh, for Cosmology Physics at the University of Chicago, Brian Green, Professor of Mathematics and Physics at Columbia, Stephen Weinberg, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Texas at Austin and winner of the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics. Our number, one 800 9898255 uh, Lawrence you wanted to say something yeah to jump in uh, to what Steve was saying uh, it, it, one of the things we're actually going to have a, a discussion if not a debate at this meeting about is that one of the explanations that's been proposed is one that many scientists find distasteful and but it may be true and that is that um, this energy of empty space is such that if you had a little bit more just a little bit more galaxies wouldn't form and if galaxies wouldn't form then stars wouldn't form and if stars wouldn't form then astronomers wouldn't form so the argument is the universe is the way it is because there are astronomers here to observe it. And, and that may sound ridiculous, and some scientists think it is, uh, but nevertheless, it's become a, a possibility. And in fact, some uh, string theorists in particular have argued that that, that may be the prediction of string, or if I'm, there's I'm, any predictions I'm, at all. I'm, I'm having a senior moment about, uh, what's his name, the famous physicist who recently died, uh, who was the first proponent of that uh, in, in Texas. I'm getting his name out. And but we're here, we're here because we see the universe. Yeah, and, you know, the point is that it, many, well, many physicists find it distasteful because the, for 400 years, physics has tried to explain why the universe is the way it is right. rather than why it isn't. But um, at, at the same time, and the, for another reason, whenever we've gotten to a point where something really strange has come up, the anthropic principle has been proposed as an explanation. But in this particular case, it's such a dramatic and difficult thing to understand, and it's also there are theories... Uh, th which provide a natural mechanism for many different universes, mm -hmm. and, and string theory is one such possibility, that give that additional, uh, additional strength. And so there's, there's a huge debate in the physics community about that, about that uh, principle. Gentlemen, feel, feel, feel free to jump in at any point if you want to add something. Um, hey, I'm struck by what you said about the dark, uh, the, 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 the holy grail now is the dark energy, because just a few years ago we talked about uniting the forces of nature as the, the holy grail, you know, uniting gravity with the other forces, and that's sort of gone into the background, Michael. I sort of 
faded a bit. You can't always choose the problems that nature gives you. So we're still very interested in looking uh, at hints for the unification of the forces from the early universe. And one of our other uh, big holy grails in cosmology right now is to test this idea of inflation, the idea that the universe went through a growth spurt and that uh, this growth spurt very early on, which explains a lot of the features of the universe and today, including the galaxies uh, mm -hmm. and astronomers that we know exist, uh, by blowing up quantum fluctuations, uh, that would be a, could be a big clue and piece to this unification. And so that's one of the other uh, major threads is, did the universe really go through this growth spurt? And uh, thanks to the instrumentation we now have, particularly measurements of the microwave background, we're starting to test this idea. And what we might do in the next 10 years, um, probably more likely than solving dark energy, is to figure out when and if uh, inflation took place. And if it really did take place, it could be a clue to this unification mm -hmm. of the forces. Brian, well, when the Large Hadron Collider does get up and running, what is it, slated for November or something like that? Somewhere around there, when they get it fixed. Um, what particles, uh, Michael mentioned the particle, what particles would help you in, in, in your string theory ideas? What would you like to see come out of that? Well, there's a class of particles that string theory naturally gives rise to that are called supersymmetric particles. I mean, the full name of string theory is super string theory, and the super refers to this feature called supersymmetry. And the idea is that for every known particle species, electrons, quarks, neutrinos, there's a partner particle that we haven't yet seen. For the electron, the supersymmetric electron, or the selectron. For quarks, quarks, neutrinos, neutrinos. You know. Is that because we think nature is symmetrical or likes to be symmetrical? Well, there, there are a number of pathways that lead to this idea. And one is this notion of unifying all the forces. Mm -hmm. So string theory is an approach that naturally does unify all the forces. But what comes along with that unification is this super symmetric nice. quality. Right. So that, that's sort of one approach. There also are some experimental hints that this actually is a better way of describing existing data. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of avenues of thought that lead to this idea, and we'll look for the particles and see if they're found. What about this thing called the Higgs boson? The Higgs boson is a, another important particle that I'd say the majority of physicists think we will find at the Large Hadron Collider. And it's the particle that gives mass to the conventional other particles in the world around us. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the electron has the mass that it does according to this approach is that we're all immersed in a kind of Higgs ocean, a Higgs field, a misty Higgs molasses, if you will. Hmm. And as the electron tries to go through this Higgs molasses, it experiences a resistance to any acceleration, and that's usually what we call mass. Now, if this Higgs molasses is around, you should be able to hit it really hard, which you'll do with the Large Hadron Collider, and chip off a little piece of it. And that little piece would be a Higgs particle, and we'll look for that. Mm -hmm. Stephen, do you think we'll be more upset if we find it or more upset if we don't find it? Well, I think it'll be a lot more exciting if we don't find it. Um, some of us are dreading that the, what the LHC will find is a single electrically neutral Higgs boson where it's expected with a mass of... Uh, oh, let's say 130 or 150 times the mass of the proton, and nothing else. I think that would be the worst possible outcome. Much better outcome would be if they didn't find it at all. That why? Would... If they're going to look for it, why is that? Yes, then we have to go back to the theoretical drawing boards. I mean, there are theories uh, uh -huh. that manage to explain masses and explain why the different interactions don't have the same properties, uh, so-called broken symmetries. There are theories uh, that don't have a Higgs boson in them, and um, hmm. those theories wow. might turn out to be right, although they have problems. They're not as popular as the theories in which the Higgs boson appears, but it would be, it would be exciting to be sent off in a new direction. <laughs> what would, but, but, uh, but it would be really boring just to find the Higgs boson. <laughs> well, let me, let me, Lawrence, you want, I'll, I'll move yeah. back to you all in a second. Why, uh, this, is, this is something I haven't heard from physicists. Well, no, but I mean, I think it's the biggest misconception about science is that somehow scientists are happy understanding things. In fact, if you're a theorist, you're happiest when you don't understand things because there's a lot more to understand about nature. I mean, and in fact, that's the other thing that, that I think Michael was referring to. Nature surprises us. And that's the great thing. I mean, if, if we didn't, if nature wasn't more imaginative than we were, we, we could just sit in closed rooms and just come up with theories of everything. But in fact, nature surprises us. And every time we put a new window on the universe, 
almost every time, it surprised us. And dark energy was, a, was just came out of nowhere. Right. And, and so uh, that's what makes science exciting, is in fact the, the, the search for, is not understanding. And, that, and, and for many people, that's uncomfortable. For scientists, that's, that's the best, to huh. be perplexed is the best state of mind to be in. And just to add to what Lawrence said, I think uh, Stephen saying that uh, particularly illustrates it, because the Higgs particle finishes his story his uh, unification of uh, the electromagnetic and the weak force. And so here we have Steve Weinberg, instead of saying, oh, all I want for Christmas is the Higgs from the LHC, uh, what he really wants is clues about where to go next and new puzzles. And I think uh, that's, that's what scientists are all about. Brian, tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important point, but Thank you, it's, it, it's one that... It really even has um, a, 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 an important implication for how we go forward with funding. I mean, if you, if you find nothing at the LHC, that would be really exciting to us. But imagine going back to the funding agency and said, you know what? Here's what we found. Uh, nothing. Uh, <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Yeah, so, so, but, but if you have a public that really is attuned to what science is about, mm. which is going into the unknown and not finding what you expected, and that's what really gets the juices flowing, then a result such as we didn't 